Well, hello there and welcome to another edition of Warbird Wednesday. My name is Fred Bell. I'm the vice chairman of the Palm Springs Air Museum. And today, as you can tell, Greg has outdone himself with my headgear. He is my jejun assistant today, my jejun assistant. He's actually cut the words down a little bit, so that's been helpful. But what he's done with the word selection, he has really gone all the way over the top. Now, there is a unique product affiliation here. Obviously, I think not only do I look ridiculous, Greg, but I'm a moose, right? I think this is a moose. So I am uh, in the realm of Canada. And today we are going to talk about a very interesting airplane, the de Havilland Canada, the DHC-1, the chipmunk. But before I do that, I'm going to remove my festive, I think this is kind of festive, festive moose headgear to Greg, my assistant, who has outdone himself again off camera there with my my uh, exciting headgear. Now, the uh, chipmunk is a design that kind of inline, you know, uh, tandem seating arrangement with uh, trainers that had evolved out of, um, out of World War II. Now you have to remember one thing before we go into the airplane. People are saying, and I said it last week, uh, we have been going down helicopter lane. We lost our beloved artist, uh, Steve Maloney, quite unexpectedly a couple of weeks back. We still have one helicopter to cover, the Kiowa, but that's tied directly to Steve. We're gonna go ahead and finish up here and then we'll be back with the Kiowa next week. We don't really, talk about the stuff that we have in the future, but uh, we'll give you a little bit of a sneak peek on that. So with these immediately post-war trainers, we were still dealing with a couple things. We were still dealing with a propeller, obviously. They're mostly propeller-driven airplanes. We were seeing, like in the T-34, which I have a model here, and the T-28, some of the other versions, them going up to tricycle gear. And the reason was they wanted to teach ground handling with these jets that were coming in but they were still being built quite rugged and simply because, you know, quite frankly, you're taking people out to train them. It's like, think about driving school, right? You're not going to take somebody out and teach them to drive in a Ferrari. You're going to teach them in a, an economical vehicle because you're going to fly them really a lot and, and you're going to beat them up and the students are going to be hard on them. So the trainers were all built that way. They were built like flying an anvils. They were built to be tough. Unlike when we talked about the Stearman, the Stearman had a real problem in that uh, there were things you could do with the Stearman, like stall that lower wing as an example, or ground loop the airplane, that it had some really bad tendencies. As they went through training through World War II, it became clear that we wanted was a balanced airplane that was more docile in the air and more forgiving to the student. I have control. You have control, sir. Before we finish, John, I'll show you a steep bank to starboard. Follow me through. Right, sir? John Andrews is just completing his first flight in a chipmunk. The Ministry of Defence called it an air experience flight, and that's a good name, because it's an opportunity for ATC and CCF cadets to experience a flight, and to experience taking control of an aeroplane. A chance to learn what it's all about. The chipmunk could not be a, uh, a more airplane that was going down that doctrine, that, that what I just talked about, getting out all the bad things and trying to get something that was fairly easy for a student pilot to fly. So as I said, I don't have, Greg has not found a chipmunk model for me yet. You have, but it's Alvin and the chipmunks, I think. I couldn't help Greg, I just couldn't help it. But what I talked about, you know, um, uh, a good economy and lift on the wing, uh, simple power plant, not too much power, not too much torque, uh, inline, uh, tandem seating. The canopy on the trainer was simple from a standpoint, a high visibility canopy. You would have an instructor and a student. You'd have a dual stick, dual instrumentation. Uh, the airplanes were becoming all metal to this point. We're getting away from fabric. Uh, and, and anything that wasn't uh, really durable 
but and the airplanes they weren't very fast the maximum speed on a DHC-1 was 138 miles an hour so it wasn't terribly fast they were built by de Havilland Canada from 1946 to 1996 now the one thing about them and Greg can throw up a plan view and some pictures the aircraft was built under license and there are some canopy and some fuselage changes depending who built them. So Greg can maybe go out and get the various versions and throw them up. We're not gonna cover any individual version, although I will say I like, this is a late canopy on this airplane with that high visibility canopy, that bubble canopy. I really, really like that in terms of visibility and, and overall vision in the airplane. The, um, this aircraft was built as a successor to the Tiger Moth, which Greg can throw up one of those, uh, an image of one of those things. Now the one thing, and maybe, um, uh, and I, you know, I don't know of any of these airplanes. A lot of trainers were pressed into service as uh, cheaper fighter bombers during, and they were used in various attack versions. I do not know of any chipmunk that was turned into, Greg, an attack chipmunk. I don't. I don't know that there were any. Now, now, somebody may prove me wrong, and and but I don't think that any of the chipmunk line was ever turned into an attack airplane or had any type of underwing stores. You will look at this wing when you look at the wing, and one of the things you'll notice that this is a stress-skinned alloy wing that allows you to do is have a longer, thinner airfoil on the wing. So the wing is a little bit longer, but it's fairly lightweight. So it really, really cool design. Now, the uh, as you can see, a, uh, a fixed gear setup. The aircraft had fixed landing gear, which you've seen a lot of trainers. Uh, very narrow, narrow fuselage and extremely simple uh, engine placement and design, a very narrow fuselage. But again, all of the classic traits of these trainers. Now, Greg, what I want to do today, I'm going to move to my stage two. And on my stage two, I'm going to say something about uh, de Havilland. Uh, we really have to uh, give de Havilland uh, a lot of credit. You know, we've talked about the Beaver and other things they've done, de Havilland Canada, uh, to our Canadian counterparts. Excellent airplanes. You know, you got to look at those airplanes and go, they are just fantastic uh, machines. They were thought, well thought out, well built, well designed. And, and you can't say enough good things about Canadian aviation. Up to Greg and I, we're gonna do Canada Day here in a week. We're gonna talk about all this fun stuff, aviation stuff coming out of Canada, which is a little timely, whether you view this um, episode in, in order or not, but we do do a Canada Day here at the museum. And we'll even talk about the arrow. I think Greg, we're gonna talk about that, which is uh, Greg can throw up a vision of the arrow the Arrow was a fighter that was years ahead of his time. I'm not going to get too far into it here, but that airplane, if it had ever seen production, would have really been a game changer, and that came out of Canadian aviation. So today what I'm going to do is I'm going to look and see what Greg has uh, got for me. And Greg, who never misses a beat on, uh, on theming, has uh, come up with bacon soda. Good job. Is this... We, we, we talked about this off camera, Greg. Is this Canadian bacon soda? We really don't know. Now, of course, it says that this is Lester's fixin', the, uh, the usual guy. Uh, Lester, you're, you're trying to kill me, buddy. Um, this is artifi artificially flavored bacon. So no real bacon was harmed in the making of this soda. So this is exciting. Uh, pure cane sugar. Um, this is rocket fizz soda. We've seen these guys before. These are really, really sick soda makers who sit around and go, well, what other, can I, can I do a gravy soda? What else can I do? But this uh, has 170 calories, uh, no sell by date. So uh, Greg, again, you're, uh, you're putting me out into the outer reaches of uh, known, um, known um, ethics on uh, soda production, but we're gonna go ahead and open this. So to all of the Canadian aircraft designers and Canadian air crews, these guys are absolutely fantastic, the guys and girls that do this. And I, I wanna salute all those fine Canadian aviation folks. So with that, I'm going to jump into bacon soda. 
no hint of it. Well, maybe. There might be a little bit of uh, bacon on the grill there. Oh, man. <laughs> Again, you know, Greg, we I don't know that we've gotten one of these or two of these in the last few weeks that I've been able to finish. Oh, that's disgusting. <laughs> um, I guess if you pureed bacon, maybe that's what it tastes like. For all you Canadian uh, aviators out there, I'm taking one for the team here. We're going to... Oh, man. Mm. Oh, Greg, we're going to return that to its hollowed place on the table and uh, say thank you very much for that experience. And after I get off camera, I'm going to have to go brush my teeth. That That is just, oh, oh, okay. Well, we uh, we did our salute there. and But again, seriously, uh, to all the Canadian aviators and Canadian designers, just fantastic job. There's nothing but great product that comes out of Canada. Now, uh, this aircraft actually continued to soldier on. It went into affectionato or enthusiast hands and numbers. This one is no exception. This is actually here for our Canada Day. It is visiting. Uh, a couple of interesting things about it. Um, the um, Oswald Jackal Mink, if I didn't screw up his name, is the principal designer on this airplane. Maybe if you can find his, I'm sure I screwed up his name. And if I screwed up your name to the uh, Jack, Jack, Jack Lemink, Jack Lemink family, I apologize. You can screw up Fred Bell, say it backwards, Leb or something like that. But uh, he was a principal designer on this airplane. Uh, he really came up with a fantastic design, but the airplane continued to soldier on. It went into private hands. Uh, George Neal, set the world record as the oldest licensed pilot in this airplane in, in 2015 at 96 years old. If you can believe that, he was still flying in this airplane. Uh, and the last serving chipmunks uh, in, the, uh, in Europe that I know of, and if you know of something else, put it into the comment section, but the last serving chipmunks we were at the Battle of Britain flight. Under 140 miles an hour. The Chipmunk was originally conceived as a successor to that most famous of all biplanes, the de Havilland Tiger Moth, for both the Royal Air Force and Royal Canadian Air Force. The RAF ended up taking 735 of these aeroplanes. Early orders for the Chipmunk were rather slow. It made its first flight from the de Havilland factory airfield at Downsview in Toronto on the 22nd of May 1946 and came into service with the Royal Canadian Air Force a couple of years later but at that time of course there were still large numbers of surplus wartime training aircraft, Tiger Moths, Harvards and the like that were perfectly serviceable, perfectly usable for continued post-war use and of course an awful lot of governments including Britons were virtually broke at the end of World War II and didn't have huge funds with which to buy new aeroplanes the chipmunk also gained an undeserved negative reputation for certain tricky handling characteristics, but things soon picked up from there, not least after the first RAF chipmunks came into service with the Oxford University Air Squadron at Kidlington. That was in February 1950, and the great uh, de Havilland test pilot Pat Fillingham, who went out to Canada in 1946 to make the type's maiden flight, led the first batch of chippies into Kidlington from the factory airfield at Hatfield. Uh, quite a long evaluation took place prior to Royal Air Force service of the uh, chipmunk. They came into use with University Air Squadrons, the reserve flying squadrons of the RAF Volunteer Reserve, and latterly the air experience flights, giving flying experience to members of the Air Cadets. So uh, the, this is a, a great example and a loving, res lovingly restored version of this trainer. It will continue to soldier on, I'm sure, for years. But if you have an interest in Canadian aviation, what do you need, Greg? You need one of these fine, fine, Canadian shirts with the round L. We talked about the round L with the maple leaf. That is fantastic. It is wonderful. Uh, this, Greg, will make sure we have the link. 
and we'll throw that up on our website. You need to get out and get one of these. This will make you a better pilot, and as I say many times, it'll make you 15 miles an hour faster, especially if you're Canadian. So get out to the, uh, to the site and order one of these. Uh, remember, we cannot do the restorations and do what we, hear, we do here at the museum without your donation. So get out to that website and give us a donation. Subscribe to our YouTube page and like us on YouTube. Leave a comment if you want. Like us on Facebook. And I am going to thank you for joining us today. My name is Fred Bell, the Vice Chairman of the Palm Springs Air Museum. Have a great day.